Hello everyone. Today is Wednesday, March 25th, uh, and today we're going to be turning to the book of Matthew chapter 14. If you'd like to get out a Bible and be turning there, Matthew 14. Uh, I'm going to start reading here in just a moment from verse 22 to verse 33, but before I do that, let me tell you a little bit about what's going on here. Uh, so we come to verse 22 right on the heels of a major miracle. Uh, Jesus has just a moment ago uh, fed a crowd of 5,000 plus people using only a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And it's right after this major miracle has occurred that we find this story, which to me is a story about interrupted stillness. So let's take a look, beginning in verse 22. So immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And right there when it talks about dismissing the crowd, of course it's talking about the 5,000 plus that Jesus has just spent his day feeding in that miracle. So he dismisses the crowd. Verse 23, and after he had dismissed the crowd, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against him. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, and they said, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. So Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. So he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. So Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Once I remember in a Bible class, I had a teacher who challenged us to do something creative, and it must have worked, apparently, because years later, here I am, and I, I still remember this lesson. So we were all sitting at tables, uh, with a pen in our hands and a sheet of blank notebook paper spread out before us. And our teacher opened up his Bible and he read those very same words I just read from Matthew chapter 14. He read those words slowly and with much feeling he told the story to us. And then he gave the challenge. Put yourself in the shoes of one of those people in the story and rewrite the story in their words. In other words, imagine that you are one of the people who were there for this moment, whether it was one of the disciples who saw it all from the boat or whether it was Peter when he stepped his feet out on the rushing waves or, you know, even get creative with it if you want. You know, you could be a fish in the ocean looking up from below and watching all of this take place. But whatever you choose, put yourself in that person's place and tell the story and imagine what was going through your mind when you saw that ghostly figure on the horizon. What were you feeling when you stepped out onto the rushing Waves when the wind started to howl. What were you, what were you experiencing? In fact, uh, if you want, you can try this. I told you I'm going to look for silver linings, right? Well, uh, please don't feel like you have to do this. But if this is something that sounds interesting to you, you can pause the video right here, get out your pen and piece of notebook paper, and try this exercise. Put yourself in one of the people in the story's shoes and and ask yourself. What were you seeing? What were you experiencing? How would this moment have changed you if you were in it? There's just one rule. If you do this uh, and you press pause, you have to come back and hear the rest of this lesson. Personally, though, whether you are interested in doing the exercise or not, uh, I can tell you from my own experience, 
what this did for me, uh, I found it really helpful. I, I found it actually to, to help me to think about this story in a new kind of way. And believe it or not, I, I actually still have it right here. Uh, it's just a little half page uh, story on notebook paper that I wrote uh, several years ago. And I want to share it with you. Because I think that it might help us to think about this story, which I said a moment ago is a story of interrupted stillness. Now, what I'm about to share with you, uh, it's just my imagination. It's not the scriptures. And, and we're actually going to spend our time in these scriptures in a moment. We'll talk about the word of God itself. But this is just me imagining what it would be like to step into this story. And what I wanted to think about as I stepped into this story is something that fits with our Wednesday theme of stillness. That is, what would it be like for Jesus, fully God, fully human Jesus, to answer the call of the disciples out on the waves when what he is really wanting and craving in his soul is not another rescue mission, but instead a moment of quiet, a moment of rest with God. So this is just me imagining what I would feel like if I were in Jesus's shoes. And I start the story there when Jesus is on the mountain by himself in prayer. So this is what I wrote. A moment's rest with God. This is my hiding place. Finally, a space to breathe, to be still, to be angry, to grieve, alone, on this shaded sloping glen, watching the clouds light up and spin and form into a storm, another storm, another cry at sea, tugging me out of solace and into ministry. Do they know how tenuous even for me it is to climb on waves? Do they know how burdensome on me it is to carry the load of a world of little faiths? Yet this is my tender gift, to bear up in my arms they who call and hope and try and sink. This is my beaten path, awakening wonder where it has fallen asleep. That's just my imagination. Uh, I know that that probably says more about me than it does about Jesus. Certainly it, it does. But I also hope that maybe that helps us to start thinking about something I think is very true of this story, which is that it is a story about interrupted stillness. Now, last week we spent our Wednesday lesson talking about Elijah finding a moment of quiet stillness in the aftermath of some crazy things, an, an earthquake, a mighty wind, a fire, and, and finding a moment of quiet stillness on a journey that's very difficult for him. When Elijah is feeling like his life is on this dead-end path, when Elijah is actually running for his very life, and even though Elijah might not have wanted the path that led him to that moment, that moment of quiet stillness for Elijah was what he really needed to find God's presence, uh, to find his purpose, to find that he was not alone. It may not have been what he wanted, but it was what Elijah needed. That was last week. Well, this week I want to talk about the other side of that question. Like, what about all those times when a moment of quiet stillness is what we really want? Like, when it's what our souls and bodies crave, but all the things in life, even the most important and needed things in life, continue to interrupt our pursuit of a quiet moment with God? What about when the things of life continue to draw us out of stillness and into something else? In other words, Elijah might not have wanted stillness, but he really needed it. What about all those times when we really want stillness, but so many other things get in the way? How do we find that balance between our desire for stillness and all those pressing needs? that continue to call out our name? Uh, to me, this is a really pressing question right now because it's true, like we said last week, that many things in our world seem like they are all just screeching to a halt all at once. That is true of many things, but it is not true of everything. And it's certainly not true of everyone, including a whole lot of you. And so as I've continued to dwell on this 
subject of stillness. And as I've continued to reflect upon what's going on in our world and in our church right now, I've been thinking about all of those among us who might really be wanting stillness with God and yet struggling to find it, finding it hard to balance that with a whole lot of pressing needs and important obligations that keep calling for our attention. Uh, So for example, I've been thinking about our parents uh, who uh, day-to-day life as a parent right now is very different with no school for your children to go to, uh, no daycares, uh, no play dates, no romping around on the McDonald's playground play place, climbing all over the place. I mean, all of those things are just kind of taken away, really changes things, right? I've been exchanging a few texts with my text messages with my brother this week, and uh, he has an 18-month-old son, Hudson, and he was telling me that entertaining Hudson is kind of a full-time endeavor right now for them. Parents may be like that, craving a moment of stillness, but sometimes that balance is tricky. And what about all those other people among us who are caring for others, caring for the sick or caring for the elderly. I think about the nurse who still works in the hospital and and they keep on going. And I think about the pharmacist who's at the the counter at CVS and and life just keeps on going. And I think about uh, parents uh, who are taking care of their parents or a mom or a dad or a grandmother or a grandfather that you still have to take care of and help along and life for them just keeps on going. These things that I'm describing are good. They're right. They're absolutely necessary. But if you are in that situation, it may not seem like the world has come to a halt. It may seem more like a whirlwind. And so how do you find quiet stillness in a whirlwind? Can you? Is it even worth trying? And the list, of course, could go on and on, Uh, like our teachers who have suddenly become online teachers and are having to just rearrange their entire approach to educating the students in their class all on the, like, the drop of a hat. Uh, I think about uh, the grocery store workers, some of whom are working double shifts just to make sure that everybody has the food that they need, Uh, or our friends at Chick-fil-A or at Whataburger or wherever, insert your job here. In many cases, the obligations pressing on us have not stopped. They've just changed, and quickly. So how do we find the balance between the rest our souls want and all these pressing needs? If I'm describing your challenge today, what I would say, in the words of Jesus, is take heart. Because in Matthew chapter 14, Jesus is making those same negotiations. Jesus is making those same decisions about rest and stillness that he wants and needs and many other important needs. In fact, if you go back to where we started tonight, Matthew 14 verse 22, where do we find Jesus? We find that he has gone up the mountain by himself to pray. He is actively seeking that moment of quiet stillness with God. But really, that's just half the story. Because in fact, from the very start of this chapter, Jesus has been seeking that very same thing, that moment of quiet stillness with God. He's been seeking it, but he's not yet been finding it because so many other pressing needs keep getting in the way. In fact, if we go back and look at the beginning of the chapter, we see why it is so important for Jesus to have a moment of rest. We see why he is craving in his soul to be still with God. The chapter begins with the death of a friend for Jesus. Verse 10 of chapter 14 begins when John the Baptist has been put to death by King Herod. And John, of course, is a a loved one of Jesus. This is Jesus' cousin on his mother's side. This is also the person who gets Jesus best, like really understands what he's all about the most out of any person in the entire world. And now that person has fallen. What does that feel like for Jesus? Jesus has lost a friend and someone who understood him. So in the wake of this loss, Jesus seeks to rest with God in quiet stillness. Verse 13, when Jesus 
heard this, and he's talking about hearing about the death of his friend. When Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself, or so he thought. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And so by the time that Jesus reaches the shore of this quote-unquote deserted place he was seeking, the crowds have already beaten him there. They're all waiting for him there. So here's Jesus in need of stillness, desiring to withdraw, but here also is this need. So what does Jesus do? Verse 14, when he went ashore, he saw the great crowd, and he had compassion for them, and he cured their sick. Another gospel will say that Jesus looked upon them like sheep without a shepherd, and he took care of them. He ministers to them. And what I would point out is that this is not like a 10-minute deal. This is like an all-day kind of deal, ministering to this crowd. And when it was evening and getting late, the next verse, verse 15, the, the disciples are tugging on Jesus' sleeve, and they're saying, Jesus, you know, it's getting kind of late. But Jesus is not yet done. Jesus is still in this moment ministering to this crowd, and now he's going to actually turn to performing that major miracle when he feeds 5,000 plus with only a few loaves and a few fish. And all of this he does, he does, while suspending his own need, while suspending his grieving heart. Jesus is negotiating the balance between quiet stillness and pressing need. And he chooses in this moment to answer the pressing need. And so he must. Later on, he's going to do this very same thing for the disciples. When they're out in the boat and the storm comes rushing in, what I can't help but notice is that Jesus doesn't wait for them on the sidelines. Here's a man who could calm a storm with a word. We've seen him do it. And yet he goes out to the disciples in the boat and he calls Peter out onto the waves and he rescues the disciples in this moment of panic and pressing need. In other words, when it comes to quiet stillness and pressing need, Jesus knows what it's like to make those choices. He has carried those burdens and Jesus shows us that he is willing to negotiate his own need for quiet rest with God with the needs to show compassionate care. And in the midst of it all, he continues to care for those who are in his care. And yet, even though Jesus does suspend his quiet stillness with God to meet those pressing needs, he still continues to seek it, that quiet stillness, wherever it may be found. In this case, Jesus finds it in between feeding the 5,000 and rescuing the disciples in the boat. In between those pressing needs, verse 22, Jesus went up the mountain by himself to pray. Now that was in the evening, verse 23, and he was there alone. And early in the morning, Verse 25, he goes out to the disciples at sea. So in other words, Jesus continued to seek and find and spend little moments in quiet rest. In this case, it was a moment between evening and early morning. In other cases, maybe it was different. But the point of all of this is this. On the one hand, Jesus very much shows that we cannot ignore the needs of those who are in our care, the needs that press on us every day. And yet, we also cannot ignore the need to spend quiet moments with God in stillness. If I could use some words that we are all too familiar with these days, a moment of quiet stillness with God can be postponed if necessary, but it cannot be canceled. Because moments of quiet stillness with God are they're like food, uh, you can skip a meal, but you can't stop eating. And it could be that when you spend those moments of quiet stillness with God, like spiritual food, it is what gives you the strength you need to rise to the occasion of the next need that comes from those who are within your care. Jesus shows us a way to deal 
with the moments of interrupted stillness in our lives. It's not about ignoring those needs of others or for those who are within our care. But it's also not about ignoring our need for spending time with God. And, and it's really mostly about just seeking that time wherever it may be found in the midst of life and all that is going on around us. This passage is calling us to remember how much we need those moments with God, even as we need to live in the world and care for those that need our help. So my prayer for you today, if you're feeling the weight of a lot of pressing needs, is that God will strengthen you for the road ahead. I, I really don't want anybody to get down on yourself if you find it hard to find these moments of quiet stillness. That's not the point at all. My hope is simply to encourage you to keep seeking them and perhaps to realize that they may be really valuable to us as we strive to be the people that God has called us to be. Let me say a prayer for you and then we'll conclude. Lord, our Father, we know that we need you. We know that we need those moments of rest with you to strengthen us and feed our souls so that we can be the people you've called us to be. I pray that you'll be with everyone who right now is dealing with a lot of pressing needs, whether that's the needs of parenting, uh, the needs of providing physical care to others, uh, the needs of going through your job or your day-to-day -day, uh, life at work, or many other needs. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us to be able to care for those that you've blessed us to be a part of their lives. Lord, I also pray that you'll help us whenever we can to seek those moments of quiet rest with you and that you would work powerfully in them to help us to be the kind of people you've made us to be. All these things I pray in Christ's name. Amen. God be with you this week and until we meet again.